Hey, in this demo we're going to show how to download the VSI plugin and how to deploy it so we can work with it later on using VMware vCenter. The first step we need to do is to go to support.emc.com and look for VSI and then sort it by downloads and the date. What we can see here is that the latest date that is available as of uh, June 24 is VSI 7.3.3. So we're just going to click it, which will trigger the download itself. The download file will result in an OVA file. Keep an eye on this file and then once it's done, please upload it to your vCenter server. Once you have the file itself, please log on to your vCenter server and go to the ES6 cluster you want to deploy it to. In my case, I have a management cluster called Source Cluster. So let's right click it deploy OVF template. Now let's select the file itself. It's on my desktop. Let's just choose it, which is this file. Press the next button. Give the VM a name. I'm just going to call it VSI 7.4. I'm going to select it as the default folder. I'm going to select the cluster that I want to deploy it to. going to accept the EULA. Now I'm going to select the VMFS data store where I want to deploy this VM2, which is in my case this one. I'm going to go and select the theme provisioning, just in case to select uh, more capacity on the deployment size of the VM itself. Press the next button, choose the routed network, which in my case is an external network that has access to my uh, vCenter server. Press the next. This is where I need to give it all the IP credentials and subnet and default gateway and DNS settings and things of that. Once I filled out all of my IP information configuration, I'm just going to click the next button and I'm now ready to deploy the OVA itself. So let's click the finish button and it will now deploy the OVA. Once the OVA has been deployed, you want to go ahead to the VM, right click it and power it up so we can then go ahead and register it in vCenter. Once the OVA powered up and finished configuring itself, you will see this prompt screen. You don't need to log into the actual OVA using the VM console. What you actually need to do is go to the IP address that you configure for this VM, which is in my case this one, with port 8443 forward slash VSI underscore USM. You will then be faced with a prompt screen. Just click administration. The login ID is admin and the password is change me the default password with capital C and capital M. So change me all in one word, capital C, capital M. Now you need to go ahead and change the default password. So please go ahead and select your own unique password that you're going to remember and use uh, when you log into the VSI plugin itself. Okay, the next step is to actually connect the plugin, the VSI OVA, with the vCenter server. So you need to click the VSI Setup tab and input your vCenter credentials and IP address or DNS. I'm just going to use DNS because it's much easier. And the default admin password for your vCenter server. And finally, click the register button. Okay. Your VSI v plugin is now registered on your vCenter and the only thing left for you to do in order to actually start working with it is configure it using your vCenter view. So go ahead and log into your vCenter server that you register it uh, from the VSI UI. Go to your home screen. Then global inventory list. Solution integration service. And click under the action tab the Register Solution Integration Service. Here you're going to enter the IP address of the SIS server, the user and the password that you're currently logged in with. And again, the integration password for the SIS. And finally, your vCenter password as well. All right, your VSI server is now registered to your vCenter server. There are many best practices that you want to apply when you work with a vSphere cluster against an extreme ARA. One way to do it is to read our user guide and apply those best practices manually through the UI. Second option is maybe to use something like a Power CLI that will script those best practices. And the third option is the preferred one is to use the VSI plugin to apply all of these operations for you. Now this can be done at the ES6 level or the cluster level. In most cases, you're probably going to do it at the cluster level, which will mean 
it will go ahead and apply all of these best practices across all the E6i host under that cluster. So in order to do it, you just right click the cluster that you want to apply the best practices on, Olium CV site plugin actions, E6IO settings. It will now ask me whether I want to apply those best practices on a native extreme IO array that is connected to this host, or maybe there is more than one array that is connected to them, and therefore the best practices should uh, slightly differ. In my case, all the E6I hosts are connected to an extreme IO array, so I'm just gonna go ahead and select all of them. Now, Pay attention to the fact that you can actually be very selective on the best practices that you want to select and some of them even require a reboot of the E6 host. VSI will not go ahead and reboot it for you. You need to do it yourself later on, but you can of course apply those best practices for you. I'm just going to apply all of them and click the next button. Basically now ask me what's the root password for the E6i host that I want to apply these best practices on. So I just selected it the confirmation screen and now click the finish button. You can now see the operation is actually progressing and we can now see that this operation has been successfully completed. Remember that some settings require those to be reboot so please do it at your own free time. Now let's go ahead and add some extreme ARAs. So the first thing you need to go to your home screen under vCenter global inventory list, storage system, actions, register storage system, and let's go ahead and select an extreme IO array. You can use the DNS uh, name or the IP address of your XMS, use an admin and the default admin password for your XMS. Once that's done, just click the OK button. There you go, and you can now see that I've registered one array. I'm gonna go next and add some uh, more extreme IO arrays that I have in my lab, right? Right, and now I have three different X2 arrays that are registered to be used uh, for this specific lab. Now that I've got some extreme IO arrays, let's go ahead and actually provision some volumes from one of them. So in order to do that, I'm just gonna go to the Austin clusters, select the cluster that I want to deploy some volumes from, all EMC VSI plugin action, and new EMC data store. Let's give the data store a suffix name, I'm just gonna call them lab. I'm going to provision VMFS data stores using the VMFS 6 file system. Here it's asking me to which and from which array I want to provision those LANs. I'm going to choose this array that as you can see has the current volumes on it. So I'm just going to select that array from the VSI plugin. The next step is which initiator groups, which E6 IOs should see that specific volume. Skip that field. Now, how many volumes I want to provision and what should be their size? So in this case, I'm just going to provision four volumes, which has four, 500 gig each capacity. So four volume counts and all of them should have 500 gig each. Then click the next button, finish in order to make sure that I'm okay with the settings. And that's about it. I will now see the progress going on from here. The first step will, of course, be that these volumes will be created on the Extreme AR array. You can see that these volumes have been created on the array itself. And the next step will be, of course, that VSI will go ahead and map these volumes to your E6i host, followed by a format operation on each one of them to the VMFS 6 files. And here we can indeed see that this is now taking place. And that's it. You can see that the operation has been successfully completed. I have four volumes call up 0010203 and each one of them is 500 gig in its size. Now, let's think about it. What will happen if I'm running out of capacity uh, on the VMFS store? Traditionally, if I want to extend the volume size, I need to go to the array itself, extend the volume, rescan uh, my E6i host, and then follow by an increase operation using the vSphere UI. But there is a better way to do it, which is just, again, use the VSI plugin to do it. So in order to increase the data store size, I just need to right-click it, all EMC VSI plugin actions, and extend data store. Now I've been prompt with how much capacity do I want to increase this data store size. So if you recall it was 500 gig and let's assume that I want to increase it by at least one more terabyte. So it will be a total of 1.5 terabytes. So selecting terabyte and click one, click the next button, confirming my operation and click the finish button. And after a couple of seconds you can now see that this data store that I've just increased its size from a volume perspective it's now 1.5 terabyte in capacity. And if I go to my vSphere, 
I can also see that from a data store perspective, this is now 1.5 terabyte of capacity. So super easy to do this operation. Instead of doing them manually, one from the array, one from vSphere is scanned, and all of these operations, you can just use the VSI plugin to do it all for you. So, so far we cover VMFS provisioning operation, but what happens if I want to add an RDM device to a specific VM? How do I do it? So you go to the VM that you want to add capacity to, right click, all EMC VSI plugin operation, new EMC RDM disk, from which array you want to provision this extra capacity from. This VM is now running on E618, so I'm going to select it as the provisioning host that this RDM drive will be attached to. And I want the other ES6 host to also be able to see that volume for cases like HA or vMotion or storage vMotion. What should be the size of the RDM drive that I'm adding? And what should be the compatibility mode? As you recall, RDM has physical mode and virtual mode uh, abilities. I'm just going to go with physical in my case. No specific share. I'm not going to touch this specific one. Just going to click the auto select operation. You can now see it has a new SCSI device to it as well. I'm clicking this operation for now. And let's see what should be the size of that specific RDM. Let's select 800 gig in my case. So once we selected the added capacity that we want to add to this VM, just click the next button and finish. We can see the provisioning operation taking place from here. And we can also see that the new RDM volume has been created on the Extreme AOR itself. And the operation has been completed. So now if we right click the VM and choose Edit Settings and Manage Other Disks, we can now see that the RDM device has also been created and added to the VM itself as an RDM device. So that's it. Super easy to work with and provision RDMs and VMFS file systems directly using the VSI plugin. VSI can also show you the array physical and logical capacity per a volume. Up until VSI 7.4, you could see metrics such as the total capacity and the logical capacity consumed by Extreme IO. So for example, since I'm talking about volume 01 now, if I actually go ahead to that specific volume, you can see that that is indeed the capacity that is consumed by the logical uh, level of the array itself. However, as of Extreme IO Zios 6.1 on X2, you can now see two new cup matrices such as the physical unique capacity and the DRR per volume. In order to gain that type of information, you need to invoke the operation that will actually calculate the saving for you. So here, if you notice, I've selected all the volumes that I want to see the physical unique capacity and the DRR per volume on them. And now I'm going to click the Manage button and calculate savings. This operation will take a couple of seconds and by the end of it you will see how much physical capacity is actually consumed by each one of these volumes. In order to retrieve this information, I'm just going to click that hamburger button and select the DRR and unique physical capacity per volume and click this one again. And now if I move my mouse cursor to the right, I can actually see the unique physical capacity consumed by these arrays. And because this is now available from the XMS, I can go back to the VSI plugin and refer that information per the given volume that I want to view its physical capacity and indeed get this information. So for example, for vol 01, you can see the unique physical capacity is 299 gigabyte and the DR is one to one. If I go to VSI, I will indeed see this information again. It's important to know that if you didn't select the calculate saving from the XMS, you will not view this information from VSI because in this version of uh, Zios, it will still require a manual calculation. So you first need to select it and then refresh and run the operation and then refresh it from the VSI plugin. Now this is a super useful feature because up until now, vSphere administrator couldn't have any type of physical information on the extreme IO level and vSphere doesn't have any awareness to concepts such as DRR per volumes or, or thing provisioning or DDoPOC compression. And now you can actually see this information directly from within vCenter. To a different degree, vSphere 6.0, 6.5 and 6.7 have the ability to reclaim capacity at both the data store level and inside the VM guest OS. The extra features that VSI brings into the table is the ability to schedule space operation 
on either the data store level or the data store itself. So let's start with a more complex use case. If I aggregate different data stores into one folder, what I can do is right click, select all MCV SI actions, reclaim annual storage, and then VSI will go ahead and run space reclamation on the first data store, followed by the second, followed by the third and the fourth, and so on and so forth. I can either run it now, or I can also schedule the operation to be a daily interval, a weekly interval, or a monthly interval. Whether in vSphere, there's no option to do it as a serial operation when it will do one and then the next and, and one and, and so on and so forth. So that's one of the extra features that VSI brings into the table in addition to also be able to schedule the space operation. It also gives the ability for using a ver version such as vSphere 6.0 to be able to optimize the space reclamation at the data store level itself. So let's just run a more a simple demo. Just select the data store that uh, already prepared in advance. In my case, it's called X1 Infra 00, and it's currently hosted on X1, and that's the actual uh, volume itself. There is only one volume currently hosted on that uh, array itself. We can record metrics such as the logical capacity and the physical capacity being uh, consumed by that specific volume. So let's try to run space reclamation on that volume and see how much capacity we can uh, potentially gain back. So in order to do it, I right click the data store itself and I'm going to select all MCV sign plugin actions and select reclaim a new storage and for the sake of the demo let's uh, run it now I need to have the root credentials to the E6 server that I'm running the space reclamation form I can test the connection the connection is validated to be successful and let's run it now if you go back to the array you will see that the bandwidth the performance start to increase that's because we're running a lot of zeros to the array itself in order to try to reclaim some of the capacity that's currently consumed. Here you can see it's been increased. You can see the IOPS and the bandwidth is very, very high. It's because we are running space reclamation on that specific data store. You can also view the progress here using vSphere itself as the unblock block operation will be flagged up. When the operation is done, which you can identify by both the fact that you now see far less bandwidth being consumed on the array and also the operation is done from here. You can know that the space recommendation has been run. Now, since this is a demo environment and I didn't generate a lot of unique capacity, you will not see a lot of savings in either the logical or the physical capacity, but in real life environments where you create a lot of VMs and delete a lot of VMs or take snapshots of them and reclaim that snapshot after the snapshot operation is done, you will see far more logical and physical capacity being saved by the array itself once you run the space reclamation operation. In order to backup and restore data store in VMs using uh, the VSI integration with Dell EMC AppSync, we first need to configure the AppSync server in the VSI plugin. So once we go to Home Inventory, we go to Data Protection System, Register Data Protection System, select AppSync, the FQDN or the IP address of the AppSync server, the username, which is an admin of the AppSync server. Now let's go ahead and test it test has been confirmed so we can now click the OK button and we now have the VSI plugin fully registered to work with AppSync. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is actually subscribe the data store and its uh, VMs that are running on it in order for it to be backed up by AppSync and then we can go ahead and do some clever things like VM restore and data store restores. Let's go to Austin clusters and click the data store that we want to be integrated with AppSync go to the configure tab and then EMC VSI. So far we can see this data store is not subscribed to any service plane in AppSync. AppSync has the concept of service plane which basically means which type of RPO we want to apply for a snapshot. Do, should it be local or remote or a combination of both? Here I'm just going to use a local a protection offered by the external snapshots and the VMware snapshot level. So in order to do that I need to click the subscribe button and then I can either create a new subscription or just subscribe to an existing one. I'm going to subscribe to an existing one that I created in AppSync. So let's just go ahead and click the subscribe button. And here I can select the one that I pre-prepared. You can of course go ahead and modify them to your liking if you just go ahead and click the create a subscribe. Differences are, for example, is how frequent should you take a backup. As you can see, the default is every 24 hours. 
things like do you want to have a VM snapshot followed by an array level consistent uh, snapshot so this way you can have the best consistency when it runs to backup all of these options are available for you I'm just going to create one that I pre-prepared and click the next button and now I can click the finish one and that's about it I now have a service plan ready that I can either wait for its next cyclic operation to run or I can run it now, which is exactly what I'm going to head, uh, go ahead and do. So in order to do that, I'm creating, clicking the service plan that I've just subscribed to and click the run button. Click the yes. AppSync will process the information. As you can see, VSI is already talking to AppSync. And very shortly, we'll see that snapshot exist on the array itself. If I also chose a VM consistent snapshot, that's exactly what's going to happen, followed by a array level snapshot. Here you can see that the operation has been successfully completed and in order for me to see the actual copies I can click the get copies button and this is the copy that was created for me. I can also click uh, things like event history to see what was happening during the subscription modification, whether it worked or not. This will be useful to debug any backup and restore operation that may or may not work. So now I can have two options for restore. I can either restore the entire data store so I'm just, I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to show it to you. So I can click the restore button. That store restore is really useful for cases where somebody completely deleted all the VMs from the data store. Less frequent and less common in the real world use case, unless it's a malicious operation. In most of the cases, you want to restore a VM or a couple of VMs. However, these are the operations you can choose. You can do clever things like what happens should... I see that I have VMs that already exist on the data store prior to the restore operation should just, just go ahead and ignore them. Should I fail the restore and think of that nature. However, as I said, I'm going to focus on this demo on the VM restore. So let's go ahead uh, back. And this is my data store. And as you can see, those are the copies that I have. And these are the VM that reside here. Now let's assume that VM05 is corrupted. For example, somebody uh, put a virus on it or I deployed a hotfix to it and the hotfix caused the VM to not boot up or become logically corrupted. How I should I go ahead and restore it? Right click the VM, EMC VSI plugin action, AppSync VM restore. It will now show me all the point in time that I can restore this VM from. Remember I only took one snapshot, so I only have one snapshot that I can restore from. The next button. Now it asks me other questions like, uh, should you want me to restore other VMs that are part of that subscription plan and are part of this data store or should I just go ahead and create and restore this specific VM? In this demo, I'm just going to ask it to restore just VM05 because VM06, in my example, is absolutely fine. There's no need to restore it. So continue to restore the selected virtual machine only. It will now ask me, do you want me to restore that VM to the original location or maybe to another location? And also, what should I do if the VM already exists prior to the restore, which is exactly the case here. I didn't delete the VM, I only powered off the original VM. And I want AppSync to override the source VM with a newly restored VM. So how can I do it? The best option to choose is something like this, delete this disk after performing a restore. What it actually means that it will unregister the VM from the source data store, power up and restore the VM from the snapshot volume and then delete the VM uh, after it's doing the restore. However, I'm absolutely fine uh, with the VM here, so I'm actually going to tell it to delete the VM from disk before performing the restore. It means that it will first delete VM05 from the source data store, then it will mount the snapshot data store, restore VM05 on the top of this existing data store. Also, what's interesting to note here is that if I go back to the array that AppSync took the snapshot from, this is the actual snapshot that it's going to use to mount and restore the VM form. So let's go right back to the UI, click the next button. Here I'm selecting the mount host to mount that restore VM2. Instant restore means that in order, in, instead of just mounting the snapshot volume and use storage in motion to move the VM from the snapshot volume back to the source volume, Instant Restore means that it will just use that VM on the snapshot volume. However, because of the super fast capabilities of Extreme IO and the metadata copies, the ability for us to storage remotion a VM from a snapshot volume back to the original volume are instantaneous almost. So I'm not going to use Instant Restore in this case, and I do want AppSync to use vCenter to use storage remotion to move the VM from the snapshot volume back to the original volume. So let's select No. 
ready to complete yes I am and click the finish button as you can see it's starting with the, with the restore itself and if we go back to the array itself we can see the snapshot volume that will be mounted to the host very soon AppSync is clever enough in order for it to not affect the snapshot volume it's going to actually take a snapshot of the snapshot so this snapshot was taken from this snapshot which is the one that's used for the granular VM restore so what it's actually going to go ahead and do is map and mount this specific snap of a snap to the host that I asked it to restore to which is why you see the mapped icon actually triggered in if we go back to the vCenter UI, we can see the restore operation is now starting. And this is the snapshot volume that AppSync is going to use to use storage vMotion to move the VM from it back to the source uh, snapshot store. As you can see, AppSync now deleted VM05 because that's what I asked it to do. And now it's actually using storage vMotion to move the VM files from the snapshot volume back to the original volume. It's now scanning uh, all of the E6 source after it's unmounted snapshot volume. There you go, you can now see that VM05 is actually located on this data store. So the restore operation is down. The only thing left for me is to actually go ahead and power up the VM, should I want it to. And also, if we go back to the array itself, we can see that only the snapshot itself exists. So it was clever enough to delete a snap of a snap that is used during the restore operation itself. While AppSync gave you the full fledgeability of the ability to backup and restore data store and VMs using cache consistency and application consistency and support to native application in the future, you can also work without AppSync, just using VSI in itself. The difference is, is that AppSync will be able to generate application consistency, whereas the VSI plugin will be able to only do crash level consistent. You can still have a scheduler if you're using the VSI plugin. And let me show you a demo of how it works. So let's assume we want to take a backup of this specific data store. We can right click it, select Olim CV Sign Plugin Action, and create a snapshot scheduler. Here we can select whether we want the snapshot to be readable or writable as well, and how frequent should we take a backup. So you can have full RPO using just the VSI plugin. But let me show how to do it without a scheduler. You again, right click the data store that you want to take a backup of. Olim CVSI plugin action and take snapshot. You can have a snapshot name, so let's call it something, let's leave it with its default and make it a writable snapshot and click the submit button in order to take a snapshot of it. See the task has been submitted and we can see the progress here. And if we we'll go to XMS, we can see that indeed uh, the snapshot been taken by the VSI plugin itself. And I'll go ahead and click the restore button I will get a warning that uh, the VSI plugin will unmount all the existing VMs that reside on this data store and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and click the OK button. You can see that the VSI now unmounting the existing data store. And finally, the restore operation is now co successfully completed. Now we're going to talk about a special integration that VSI has with the VMware Site Recovery Manager, also known as SRM. SRM is the leading automation software to automate uh, disaster recovery with VMware vSphere. From a storage perspective, what we can see is that I have a volume that I formatted, of course, as a VMFS data store, which is this volume. And if I go to data protection, I can see that there is a replication session running on that volume from 1632 to 1633. And then if we could go to the session, we can see this session is active with all the fancy new UI that we have in Zios 6.1. We can see the RPO setting. We can see the actual RPO versus the one that was set and all of the interesting things. From a vSphere perspective, I have here my uh, SRM 8.1 version, uh, which is the version that's first uh, utilizing HTML5 UI. And you can see that I created a recovery plan and a protection group, which is basically a substitute of that specific data store that I selected before, which is this one, VMFS01. And you can see that I have two VMs on this data store that I'm actually protecting. So it's all good and nice. And now I can invoke a VMware SRM either for testing purposes or for a full failover purposes by clicking the run button. Unfortunately, VMware Site Recovery Manager doesn't have any awareness to point-in-time integration, not when you're using array-based replication anyway. 
which is a big limitation if you think about it. Let's examine the arrays themselves. And if we go back to the target array under data protection session, the protection copies, you can see they actually have multiple point in times that I can recover from, which is awesome. However, SAD Recovery Manager has a big limitation, which means that I can only fail over to the last point in time, which is super ineffective if you think about it. Assume a virus outbreak or a logical data corruption. You can fail over to the remote side, but you will fail over with the data corrupted or just inconsistent, so it's no good. In order to overcome this limitation, you can use the VSI plugin with this Site Recovery Manager integration, which will allow you to fail over or test a specific failover point in time to be used with SRM. So how do you do it? Once you've got your DR set up and replication is running and you've installed SRM and all of uh, this pre-preparation, what you need to go is go back again to the home screen under Global Inventory List, VSI Data Protection System, and go ahead and register a new data protection system. I've already used AppSync, I'm now going to select SRM. This is where your configuration will vary, depends if you're actually running SRM on the vCenter server or it's on a different server. In my setup, I'm using SRM on a dedicated Windows VM and vCenter is running on a dedicated uh, Linux appliance. It's Linux appliance, so it's not, they are not running on the same server. So I'm here, I'm going to select the SRM server IP or FQDN and the port that VSI will communicate with SRM. The port will vary between different SRM configurations. Here I'm using SRM 8.1, so the port is 9086. However, please consult with your VSI user guide for changes or, or new additions of SRM and potential different ports. This is where I'm selecting my vCenter, so it's all good. Let's click the test button. You can see the test has been confirmed successfully. And that's pretty much it. Now my VSI server is fully working to work with SRM. In real life environments, you want to have a VSI server per a vCenter server. Because if you think about it, SRM stands for Site Recovery Manager. So it will assume your site, your source site, for example, is down. And because of that, you want your VSI server to have also be dedicated to your remote DR a vCenter and SRM server. However, for the case of this demo, it's one VSI server that's connected to the local SRM server, and because I'm not going to fail over my entire site, I can still leverage VSI to trigger point-in-time integration. So, once I've got my SRM server fully configured with my VSI plugin, I can go ahead to the VM view, and here you can go ahead to one of the VMs that uh, reside on the, this specific data store that's being replicated. Go to the Configure tab and Extreme I.O. Native Replication. Here you can see that it's already found the session name for that uh, volume that this VM resides on. And if I go to the available recovery points, I can see all the points in time that are currently uh, used for that. Let's actually test this. I'm going to go back here to my uh, source array data protection remote and I'm actually going to create a manual point in time so I'm just going to give it my name and I'm going to not expire it so we'll see it in a second so now I'm creating a manual bookmark in my session a manual point in time that I can use for whatever purposes indeed if I go to the protection copies under session I can see my point in time bookmark that I just created now let's go to the VSI plugin and see what we can learn here. Let's refresh this view. And indeed, I can see the point in time that I just created. So you can see that VSI is smart enough to actually look into the native replication engine and gives you all of the point in time that you can restore from. Also, if you go to the session details, we can see some other advanced parameters such as what's the RPO that I currently set for that volume, which is indeed 60 seconds. What's the session name? Is there an ETA for the next cyclic uh, replication to be completed? And what's the RPO status and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to go ahead and do now is actually select a point in and I've sorted it by time. So remember, I don't want to use the last point in time in my demo because let's assume this last point in time is as uh, data corrupted. She's going to use the one from 9.45, which is almost uh, an hour prior to the last point in time. And how should I direct SRM to use that point in time? Very easy, just over your mouse cursor onto that specific point in time and click 
set as SRM recovery point and click OK. It will expire that in three hours. So know that if you haven't run your failover within three hours, it will expire that, but for all purposes, it's absolutely uh, fine. And that's it. It's going to click the processing button, set up success. And that's it. What you can now go ahead and, and do is go to SRM. Let's assume I want to run a plan migration, which is disaster recovery that assumes that your source site is still up and running. Click the next button and it will now go ahead and run that specific uh, recovery plan and will use the point in time that I've actually selected as opposed to the last point in time. So that's it, a very unique integration between the VSI plugin to Site Recovery Manager to Extremeo Native Replication, fully allowing you to select a specific point in time for both testing purposes and for failover purposes.